This edition of the Ridley Report is brought to you by RidleyReport.com slash travel Now, um, one of these, uh, one of the things that I found very interesting in, in this is you're, you're stating that the if you take all of the nonviolent versus all of the violent conflicts between 1900 and 2006, so that's a hun- over 106 years, that violent uh, conflicts are half as effective as nonviolent conflicts. Is that the the statement? Yes, exactly. Now, also, you make another statement, which I think is extraordinarily important. Like, it's it's amazing to say, wow, it's twice as effective. But it's even more effective than that because the number, uh, when you look at, over time, violent campaigns are becoming less effective, I guess, as governments arm themselves with robots that kill. Um, and, uh, and nonviolent is becoming more effective. So it's not that they're, it's right. even staying the same. It's that right now, basically, you could make the claim, I don't know, it's something like this, that, you know, that nonviolent conflict is, say, three times or four times as effective as violent conflict. Well, well now, why do you think that is, Erica? Is it, does, do you think that no, has let, to... let, her, let, her, let her address that statement oh. that I just made. Yeah. yeah, so I think that's right. Um, over time, we're seeing an increase in both the frequency and the success of nonviolent movements. And, and I think that it's probably moving into close to, in the past maybe 15 years, probably more like three times more effective. Right. So that's essentially what you're saying. Why do you think that is? Uh, why do you feel that that has changed over time? Is it due to uh, the Internet, for instance, uh, communication improving over time to allow folks to focus on the fact that these things are happening, whereas before it would have had to have uh, spread by perhaps word of mouth or, you know, some l- by luck of uh, the draw actually having the mainstream media focus on it, whereas now anybody can report from anywhere? Yeah, you know, I, I, it's a question that I want to take up in sort of a, a follow-up study, but it seems to me that, that people learn. You know, people actually learn over time, and, and there have been these sort of waves where we've seen a bunch of successful campaigns all at once, like the 1989 campaigns, and then we saw the color revolutions and about the 99 to 2003 era, and so now we're starting to see um, another wave. The Free Talk Live is brought to you by the Free State Project. Get people together who love the ideas of freedom and get active. Seems like a no-brainer, right? Well, unfortunately, it's taken this long to actually start happening. What I mean by that is just for the liberty movement in general. I mean, for years, they tried the same old tactics over and over again. Let's run a candidate here and there across the country and get 2% of the vote and try again four years later. And after finally spinning their wheels long enough, somebody came up with a great idea to move activists to the same place. And so we're seeing more than just politics now. Not only that, the politics has been successful. But we are seeing uh, what I would say are the beginnings of a pretty exciting civil disobedience and non-cooperation movement, one that is completely peaceful, and that's kind of what we're talking about here. So if that's interesting to you and you love the ideas of freedom, go to freestateproject.org. Learn more about the reason why Mark and I made the move up here from Florida a few years ago. Again, freestateproject.org. As we bring back our special guest here, Erica Chenoweth. She is the author, one of the authors, with uh, Maria Stefan as well of Why Civil Resistance Works. And that is a book about uh, looking at the last hundred plus years or so of uh, civil resistance movements uh, around the world and looking at ones which were violent and ones that weren't. Uh, Although I don't know if I would call a violent movement civil in any way, shape, or form. So maybe I'm (laughs) using the, the wrong terminology there. Erica, are you still with us? I'm here. Uh, so, uh, civil resistance, nonviolence, major success. Not only that, you pointed out just a moment ago that that uh, nonviolent civil resistance is becoming more effective over time, and so is more effective today than it was, say, fifty or a hundred years ago. And I think that's a really important aspect of this. And you know, as I speculated before, I, I would say it has to do with the ability to communicate. For instance, the reason why we're here doing this show tonight is because of the internet. Uh, if it weren't for the internet, we would not be able able to have accomplished what we have with getting our show on the air and into people's ears uh, 
around the world. And as a result of that, people are moving to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project. And we actually have nonviolent uh, civil disobedience and non-cooperation going on on a regular basis up here. And, and more and more people are coming to, uh, to join in. And I would imagine numbers are a fairly important part in all this as well. Uh, I don't know if you focused on that in your books. I haven't read it. But uh, yep. you know, are larger movements more effective uh, than smaller ones? Seems like a no-brainer, right? Yeah, that actually is is one of the main findings in the book, which is that part of the reason why nonviolent movements are so much more successful is because they can just get more people involved. Uh, most people, no matter how much they care about an issue, are not going to be willing to kill or die for it. I mean, a, a lot of people are, but, but not enough to really generate um, a mass movement that can really, really upset and upend the status quo. So if a movement commits itself to nonviolent means, um, people can participate in all sorts of low-risk ways. For instance, they can just stay at home from work. And, you know, in some cases, that in itself is an exercise in nonviolent civil disobedience. And, and um, you know, a lot of people will, will find that an appealing way to participate um, so one of our main findings is that the bigger the movement, the more likely it is to succeed, and the more the campaign commits itself to nonviolent resistance, the less barriers people have to overcome to participate in it. Now, um, there, there have to be some sort of uh, factors that make uh, nonviolent uh, civil resistance fail, too. Uh, you said that uh, I think one out of four of the nonviolent civil resistance campaigns, which is pretty good numbers, one out of four fail. That's, that's you know, 75 percent, some level of success. What, cause, what are the sort of uh, causal factors for failure? I think one of the biggest things is that they will tend to over-concentrate their methods into a single uh, technique. So let's take, for example, the Burmese case, which we talk about uh, in the book. Um, what they did, the pro-democracy movement there in 1988, um, they relied quite a bit on concentrated protests. Um, the Tiananmen Square was the same way in China. And, and so what they were doing is sort of going to the same square over and over and over again and having bigger and bigger protests. Well, that's fine, but it's also extremely predictable, and uh, it kind of ends up making the, the movement a bunch of sitting ducks. So movements that succeed tend to have a high degree of what we would call tactical innovation, which means that they are constantly switching up the methods that they're using. Um, the Iranian Revolution in uh, the late 70s, which did not bring about a democratic regime but did overthrow the Shah of Iran nonetheless, um, they really did switch up their tactics. So they have what we call methods of concentration, where they're doing these really high-profile um, protests and rallies. But then they also had stay-at-homes and go slows and stay aways, which is when people literally just stayed in their houses for a week. Um, mm. And that in itself slowed down the economy and, and really, in a way, brought the Shah's regime to its knees. And these are very low-risk actions. It's very difficult to repress people when they're literally just staying inside their homes. Would you like to see the Ridley Report cover a specific event in person? Well, Ridley is a cheap bastard. His travel budget is close to zero, and he does not often go out of his way for stories. Unless you pay him. As of summer 09, he charges about 10 bucks an hour, plus driving expenses. Help New Hampshire Liberty events get the coverage they deserve. RidleyReport.com slash travel. 